It would be lovely to welcome Mother Desmond to take our anniversary service. I'm sorry the weather is so poor, but we are marking today our 255th church anniversary, which is a wonderful opportunity to celebrate. So Desmond, I know we're all looking forward to your message to us. Not only are we marking our church anniversary today, but also church service Sunday. And I have a letter from the PUC and from the bishops that I must read to you today. Dear brothers and sisters, for everyone 2020 has certainly been challenging to say the least. We have all found ourselves serving the Lord in ways that many of us could not have imagined before the arrival of COVID-19. Some of us have managed to master the wonders of Zoom for our worship, and others have created their own YouTube channels. Many others have forged even closer relationships with neighbours, both actual and figurative ones, but only at a social distance, and with our friendly smiles hidden behind masks, of course. Our NHS and care home workers have gone above and beyond the call of duty to serve us all, and we are so grateful for all of their skill and care. Other key workers have stocked the supermarket shelves, emptied our bins, and planned government and council services. Teachers have been back at school, trying to give our children the education they deserve in difficult circumstances. Food banks and charities have kept looking after those who face difficult times. We have all been looking out for each other in the best way we can. This has reminded us that all forms of service are valid and invaluable to those we meet friend, family, and complete strangers alike. And we know from Jesus himself in Matthew 25, verse 40, that whatever we do for others, we do for him. In serving others freely, we serve our Lord. We are also asked on this church service Sunday to serve our church, which is the body of Christ in this world. There are numerous ways to serve within the church at a local and national level. The challenges of this year have highlighted the need within congregations for those with pastoral skills and technical know-how, along with the traditional work of the local church. As you know, Synod has had to be postponed this year, but we are hopeful that it will be held next year, and there will be many opportunities there to offer for service at a national level. We need people to offer for service on all the provincial committees, including the Provincial Elders Conference, that is the Provincial Board. We also need people who are prepared to train as lay preachers and worship leaders, and of course, to offer for the ordained ministry of the Church. There will be a confidential inquiries morning by Zoom on Saturday the 16th of January. Details for this will be in the Moravian Messenger. It takes all sorts of people to keep the church going, and none of us know what gifts we have to offer until we give ourselves for service in our community, in our church, and for our Lord. Yours in Christ's service, Bishops and PUC.
Enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with prayers. For the Lord is good, his love is eternal, and his faithfulness lasts forever. Please be seated. Our opening reading is the hymn 373. When morning gilds the skies, my heart awaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. 373. Serve you in 
newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Lord, have mercy upon us. We continue with the prayers. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. God the Father, maker of heaven and earth. God the Son, Saviour of the world. God the Holy Spirit, guide and comfort. Holy, blessed and glorious Trinity. Let us give thanks to the Father. He rescued us from the power of darkness and brought us safe into the kingdom of his dear Son, by whom we are set free and our sins forgiven. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Let us pray as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray that we may hold fast to the truth of Christ amid all the dangers and temptations of life. From indifference to the love shown in your suffering and death, from error and misunderstanding, from pride, vanity, and hardness of heart, from selfish ambition, from accepting the false standards of this world, from greed and materialism, from envy, hatred, malice, and every failure of love, from unnecessary perplexity and anxiety, from all sin. Let us find strength and comfort. By your humble birth and holy life, by your baptism, fasting and temptations, by your obedience and faithfulness, by your enjoyment of the Father's good gifts, by your ministry in word and deed, by your giving of yourself to others, by your prayers and tears, by your having been despised and rejected. By your agony and passion, by your dying words, by your cross and reconciling death, by your triumphant resurrection, by your glorious ascension, by your sending the Holy Spirit, by your word and sacraments, by your living presence, by your coming again in glory, bless and comfort. And now we come to the part of the service we call age address. Well, we don't have any children in the time of our own service this morning. Let's face it, we're all children of God. And so, I haven't any prepared script for this morning. I just intend to talk a bit about it's due to the fact that over the past while I've been watching various programs on the television uh, concerning uh, young people and young teenagers and uh, children and the fact that a great number of children in this day and age seem to be suffering from various kinds of mental problems. I have to confess that something that was unknown when I was a child, but that of course is the things today. And I listened to all the, the means by which all this could be treated. The various different methods that were used, uh, talking to them and all of this kind of thing. And not once in all of what I listened to the television that I ever hear faith in the God we know in Jesus Christ mentioned. 
So I have here a little book. Uh, it's entitled Out of the Mouth of Babes. Some of them are quite funny, and I intend to read some of them to you, but I'd like to start with one or two stories from my own experience. Uh, my son Colin took his son Johnny to church for the first time. He was coming up to four years old. And the service progressed to the very end, and then the minister pronounced the benediction, and he left the pulpit to go down to the door, of course, to greet people coming out. And uh, the, the baby tugged his father's trousers and he looked up at him and he said, Where is God going now? <laughs> <laughs> so it makes you think when you have children in church during the course of the service, what really are those children thinking about? It's a good question, isn't it? Very good question. And I can remember it's years ago now, I was going out, I was in regular ministry at the time, and I was going out to take a service, I think it was over in Warland, and uh, there was a number of young lads playing football out on the driveway at the back of our houses, and I got the car out of the garage, and one of the little lads looked up at me, I was of course dressed in terrors, and he said to me, I asked me quite bluntly where was I going? And they said, I'm going to church. He thought for a minute or two and then he said, what's church? That little boy was about six coming seven. And he asked me, what's church? That's the kind of society that we're living in today. Children are being brought up with no faith whatsoever. And it's not surprising that so many of them suffer mental conditions and we have so many suicides amongst teenagers and young people. But I'll read you some of these in here. That are, that some of them are very funny. A friend who was a minister in a North Country church climbed into the pulpit and announced his text. Be still and know that I am God. And a small voice piped up at the back of the church, Is he really God, Mum? <laughs> so, as I said before, what do children think about when they're with us in church? I think if you, we ask them, in a lot of the cases, it would be quite an eye opener. A small boy returned from Sunday school in tears. When questioned by his mother about his distressed state, he replied tearfully, Jesus wants me for a sunbeam, but I want to be an engine driver. <laughs> um, a little girl had been to Sunday school for the first time and was asked by her mother how it compared with her day school. Oh, I like it much better, she said. There are no exams there, and at the end you go to heaven instead of high school. <laughs> <laughs> These have all been compiled by things children actually said by a gentleman called Phil Mason. So it, they're pretty good, some of them. On another occasion, the teacher was exploring the children's notion of God. She asked, Tommy, who is God? Six-year-old Tommy furrowed his brows and thought for a moment or two about the question. Suddenly he brightened up and with a grin said, I think God is the man who saved the Queen. We sometimes wonder what our children are being taught on occasions. One Pentecost Sunday, the scripture reading was from Acts chapter 2. Tongues of fire sat on each of them. And looking at the bald heads in front of her, my little daughter said, Was their hair burned off now? I gave my four-year-old daughter money for sweets and the chapel collection plate. Seeing her sweets, I asked if she had given some money to God. No, she replied, he wasn't there. <laughs> I, I always laugh when I read some of these. Now, this is one. The Reverend Billy Graham tells a story of the time 
when he arrived in a small town to preach. Wanting to post a letter, he asked the small boy where the post office was. When the boy told him, Graham thanked him and said, If you come to church this evening, you can hear me telling everyone how to get to heaven. I don't think I'll bother, the boy said. You don't even know your way to the post office. <laughs> service for the first time with his grandmother. When the collection plate was passed along the queue, grandmother put some coins in it. The little boy piped up, I'm not five yet, Gran. You don't need to pay for me. <laughs> and this one, little boy to his minister, I don't pray every night because there are some nights I don't need any. <laughs> I think those are very good. But it makes you think makes you think what children think about, even in church. I can remember one Sunday here in Grace Hill, it was a long time ago, Sister Roberta Thompson had been out to Tanzania, and she was talking to the children about her trip out there, and she asked the children, what does your mommy do when you take on well? And a little voice piped up from the back, I've forgotten who he was, gives me call well, that's it. I leave you to think about it. Think about what your children think about when they come into church. And spare a thought for the children that are being brought up today with no faith at all. This is very prevalent in our society today. When I was a small boy, going to church in Sunday school, the streets and the road were filled with people going to church. And buses were laid on at that time for people and they waited up in the diamond in the hovel to get them out of church. <coughs> the church, the buses were laid on especially for people going home from church. How things have changed. Let's pray our children. Grant to our children, Lord God, this gift above all, that as they grow in knowledge, they may grow also in grace and enter into the herd of faith in you. Give to those who have the care of them wisdom, patience and love, so that the homes in which they grow up may be to them an image of your kingdom and the care of their parents a likeness of your love through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we sing now the hymn 507. <laughs> Lord of the home, thine only Son, receive the mother's tender love. 507. <laughs>
We follow now with our scripture readings. The reading from the Old Testament comes from the book of Psalms, Psalm 122. Hear the word of God. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set there, for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, Peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. And then our New Testament reading comes from the book of Matthew. We read in the 16th chapter of Matthew, commencing from verse 13. Hear the word of God. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus, the Christ. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us bow our heads in prayer to use the collect for today. Let us pray. Almighty God, to whose glory we celebrate the anniversary of this church, we give you thanks for the fellowship of those who have worshipped in this place, and we pray that all who seek you here may find you, and bring filled and being filled with the Holy Spirit may become a living example, a dwelling place for your life-giving presence in the world. We ask it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we sing now the hymn 6. O word of God incarnate, O wisdom from on high.
we offer firstly prayer for the church. Lord, you are head of the church. Direct and watch over her so that she may be a faithful instrument of your purposes. Strengthen and support those who suffer for the sake of the gospel. Unite the people of God. Increase our understanding of the mystery of God. Use us to show ever more clearly the glory of your life, death, and resurrection. Hear us, O Lord. And we pray for the mission of the church. Watch over all who work for the spread of the kingdom of God. Let your spirit and power inspire their witness by word and deed. Give to bishops and ministers a true understanding of your word and a Christ-like concern for your people. Guide those who bear office and strengthen all your people for mission to witness and serve in love. Hear us, O Lord. And we offer prayer for the nations of the world and we remember at this time that there are many places that wars are proceeding between, of course, at the moment, a war between Armenia and Azerbaijan. Ab I think that's the pronunciation of that particular country. And of course, uh, places like uh, the Yemen and Somalia and Sudan, there's a lot of unrest throughout the world in which we live in today. Guide in the ways of justice and peace all who have responsibility for ruling the nations of the world. Give wisdom to those in authority. Deliver us from the sin which gives rise to war and violence. Teach us so to order our life together that the kingdoms of the world may reflect the kingdom of God. Hear us, O Lord. And we offer prayer for everyday life. Lord, bless the people of this land. Cleanse us from all evil. Teach us to serve one another in love. Help us to be faithful in our daily lives. And give us the strength to withstand the adverse pressures and influences of modern society. Grant peace and safety with justice for all. Strengthen family life and grant wisdom and understanding to those with responsibility for the care and nurture of children and young people. Hear us, O Lord. And we offer prayer for those in need and we remember those known to us in our hearts as we offer this prayer. Lord, send help to all in distress or danger. Defend the defenseless. Comfort the lonely and sad. Support the sick, the anxious and the bereaved. And in their weakness and suffering, let them know your love. Comfort the dying with your presence and peace, and with the hope of eternal life. Hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Receive our prayer. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Accept us as you do. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Give us your peace. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling and to bring us faultless and joyful before his glorious presence, to the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, might and authority from all ages past, now and forever and ever. Amen. And we sing now the hymn 301. Colours of day gone into the mind, the sun has come up, the night is behind. 301. <laughs>
our joy and our heart's delight, Lord God Almighty. For we bear your name. May the peace of the Lord Jesus be our comfort, his love be our strength, his presence our joy. And may the words of our lips, our thoughts and actions in his name be to God's honour and glory. Amen. That uh, reading from the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel, I find particularly interesting. Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And some said Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And then Jesus went on to ask them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied was that God the Father had revealed this to him. And Jesus continued, you are Peter. The Greek word he used there, of course, was the word petros, which means a small stone or a chip of a rock. And on this rock he used the word petra, which is the rock itself. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. The rock is, of course, not Peter. Jesus substituted Petra, foundation of the rock for Petrus, Peter's name, a fragment of the rock. The rock, of course, as we all know, is Jesus Christ himself. And the church, the church is built out of, back in those days, the nucleus of those followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we proceed through the arrest, the cross, the death of Christ, the burial, the resurrection, and subsequently Pentecost. They were told to wait in Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. And the day of Pentecost came. There were about 120 people in that upper room. And the church began when those 120 people were empowered by the Holy Spirit of God, the presence of Jesus Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit of God. And their task, you shall be witness to me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Witnesses to all. The gospel of the kingdom of God, entry into which is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ shed the Apostle Paul put it extremely well in the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1 and verse 23. And I quote, We preach Christ crucified to them who are called Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. And so on this anniversary Sunday we continue. The temple, that great temple in Jerusalem, long ago represented in a sense God's presence there and there's a sense of course in which these buildings in which we worship the churches throughout our land represent God's presence in the communities in which they stand <coughs> the psalmist we turn to him now the psalmist said, I was glad. Exalted the psalmist when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And I was thinking about that. And I remember our opening hymn, when morning gilds the skies, my heart breaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. I was thinking about, and I wonder how many of us on a Sunday morning, when we were waking up, come out with those words. I won't ask for show of hands, but it's worth thinking about. Do we awaken on Sunday morning with anticipation, looking forward, 
to meet the God they know in Jesus Christ and worship in the churches to which we belong. I was glad, exalted the psalmist, when his friends invited him to accompany them on their pilgrimage to the temple in Jerusalem. The psalmist voiced his joy. I was glad, he says. Robert Sherwood calls the theatre the dwelling place of wonder. And the Christian writer has this to say about these words. How I covet this title for the church. Is that not a tremendous thought? The church as the dwelling is one. Our little church here in Grace Hill, any church, wherever it's situated in the country, the dwelling place of one. It should be. Can be, and indeed it will be, if like the psalmist, we prepare ourselves for worship, and we come with anticipation, come prepared to enter into the worship with a whole heart, prepared to meet the Lord, prepared to sit at his feet and hear him speak to us the words of life. I was glad the psalmist this church, this church in which we meet today, this can be the dwelling place of wonder. This church, where we worship week by week, its age, of course, cannot be determined in terms of years, as I understand the case, the 255th. But it cannot be counted in terms of years. Beginning from here, we can look back across millenniums. Beginning from here, we, there is but one institution in the beginning that antedates the church, and that is the human family. When God created man and woman, and he brought them together in marriage, the oneness between the man and the woman in the sanctity of marriage represents the oneness of the triune of God in heaven. And that's why the family is so important. Thousands of years ago, the psalmist wrote, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And long ago, long before we find men bowing down together in worship of God, we find a beautiful picture in the opening chapters of the Bible of man walking together in fellowship with God in the Garden of Eden. This church, of course, is linked back. Back through the centuries. Back through the Christian era. Back through long, long periods of Jewish history. Back to long forgotten beginnings. This is the dwelling place of wonder because of the mystery of God. In Sherwood's thought, the actors, the principal actors, are seen on the stage. Here in church, the principal actor is never seen, and yet is very real. What was it Jesus said to you? Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The unseen presence is here. And the unseen presence is a mystery. And by that mystery, we are filled with awe. I'm reminded of a description of worship. I first came across it when I was at college. It was in one of my colleagues' books. It was Henry Sloan's Coffins, The Public Worship of God. And so I looked it up again. Worship is the odd and glad spontaneous response of the spirit of man when confronted by the God of Christian revelation, the God of creation and redemption. This response, of course, is God initiating. The congregations of Israel's temple believed that it was God within their hearts who prompted their approach to him in adoration. And from Psalm 27, we read this, when you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face, Lord, I will see. 
we worship for sheer delight. Or we should worship for sheer delight. We glorify God. We enjoy Him. The unseen God is here present with us and He manifests His presence. We see Him with the eye of faith. Isaiah saw the Lord in the temple. I saw the Lord sitting on the throne high and lifted up and his, the train of His robe filled the temple. Too often, let's face it, in this day and age, too often the God who is high and lifted up is clear away from man's problems. Man runs away from his troubles. And yet this great God, beyond man's thinking or even understanding, is in the midst of our many problems. His presence fills the temple. In the temple, God spoke to one. He spoke to Isaiah. The presence of the risen and exalted Christ, fulfilling his promise to be with us and to make himself known to us. God is here. This is the dwelling place of one. This is the dwelling place wonder because of the many miracles that are seen here. In Jesus' day, a Thomas leper, walking in the precincts of the temple, upset the Pharisees, and quite probably quite a few people noticed the change in Zacchaeus. The church, which is the dwelling place of wonder, is the dwelling place of God, is also the dwelling place of changed people. These are the miracles. Hugh Redford, he was one time a prominent member of the editorial staff of the London Daily News, and he wrote this. If you should ask me what, by what authority I talk about the power of Christ to change human nature, I would reply to you simply, and God knows without one word or thought Posting because he has changed my nature. I can look anybody in the face today, my friends and my colleagues, and what is perhaps the most difficult of all, the members of my own household and family, and be sure that they know, as I know, that I am really and literally a new creature in Christ Jesus since the day he came into my life. This is the dwelling place of wonder because of the witness for Christ that issues from this place. The psalmist begins, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. And the same psalm ends, because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Is it not wonderful what those who worship in our places of worship, go out to do, to seek the good of their own city of Jerusalem, their own communities, their own family circles. Was it not the Apostle James who said, be doers of the word and not hearers only? And William Barclay comments, what is said and heard in the church must then be lived and done in life. What is heard in the holy place must be lived in the marketplace. And there's a little psalm. It's the shortest in the Bible. And uh, I just read it to you. Psalm 134. Behold, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who by night stand in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. The Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. Now, some say that it refers to a series of nightly services which has to do with the Feast of Tabernacles. But there's another explanation, and it seems to me far more appropriate. Who are those who by night stand in the temple? 
Are they not the workers who clean the temple? Indeed, the ancient temple must have been a most offensive place after the day's sacrifices were ended. The psalmist pictures those who cleanse the temple by night Stopping at intervals from their labors, they turn towards the Holy of Holies and they lift up their hands and shout, Bless the Lord! Bless the Lord! Surely, this humble house of ours is too the dwelling place of wonder. Because you see, the Lord is present. Let us too lift up our hands and cry, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We close our service with the hymn 314. The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. 314. Amen.